Now chapter 9 of volume 1. It talks about enabling inclusive growth through affordable, reliable and sustainable energy. The survey says that India with a per capita energy consumption of about one third of the global average will have to increase its per capita energy consumption at least two and a half times. If India has to reach the HDI level, human development index level of 0 0.8, it has to quadruple its per capita energy consumption. Now, globally, India stands fourth in wind power, fifth in solar power, and fifth in renewable power installed capacity. Energy efficiency programs in India have generated cost savings worth more than 50,000 crore and a reduction in about 11 crore tons of CO2 emission. So different government schemes have been implemented and thereby we saved 50,000 crore. The share of renewables in total electricity generation has increased from 6% in 2014-15 to 10% in 2018-19. But thermal power still plays a dominant role at 60%. The market share of electric vehicles is only 0.06% in India when compared to 2% in China and 39% in Norway. Access to fast charging facilities must be fostered to increase the market share of electric vehicles. This is the policy recommendation by the economic survey. And now if we look at the primary source of energy, you will find that Still, firewood and chips, they play a very important role so far as rural energy source is concerned. But this source has come down in 2011-12 and contribution of LPG has gone up. Whereas in urban India, very few people use firewood and chips as a source of energy in their households. And majority of people in urban India, they have opted for LPG as a primary source of energy in their households. But even in 2017, there is a section of our population without access to clean cooking. And that percentage is, in India, it is more than 50%. But when you compare this with China, in China, around 30% people are not having access to clean cooking and when you compare this with Brazil 5% people they do not have access to clean cooking so in comparison with Brazil and China India has to take so many steps because it's still 50% of the population in 2017 they do not have access to clean cooking now the kind of energy we use the way we use our energy there is a huge potential to save our energy and the table two of this chapter talks about the potential to save energy in various demand sectors. There is commercial sector where if we implement latest technology, if we instill good amount of monitoring, 22% energy can be saved. Whereas municipal corporations are concerned or their areas are concerned there is a potential to save 19% of energy. Whereas in industry sector, by using new technology, new methods, we can save 16% of electricity. And in agriculture also, there is a potential to save 15% of energy. Now, as per the Bureau of Energy Efficiency, by implementing various reforms, by implementing various types of schemes, the energy we saved Figure 10 of this chapter talks about that. With the help of Ujala, we have saved around 30% energy and a standard and labeling. That means when you go to buy any electrical appliances, you will find that there is a labeling 5 star, 1 star, 3 star. By creating this labeling and by increasing the awareness among consumers, we have saved around 48% energy. So the biggest energy saver is standard and labeling and Ujala scheme. This standard and labeling program was started in May 2006 with an objective of providing the consumer an informed choice 
about the energy and cost saving potential. Then you have for buildings, we implemented the energy conservation building code ECBC so that we can classify different buildings as per the energy consumption and based on the potential to save the energy. Then we have small and medium scale industries. For it, Bureau of Energy Efficiency has implemented various energy saving demonstrations. And likewise, the box one of this chapter gives you a detailed list, a comprehensive list of different government schemes by which energy is being saved by various demand sectors. Now we have certain terminologies. First is Perform Achieve Trade, PAT. It is an innovative market-based trading scheme announced by the government in 2008 under its national mission on enhanced energy efficiency, NMEEE, in, in National Action Plan on Climate Change. Then you have Bureau of Energy Efficiency, constituted in 2002. The function of this agency is to develop programs which will increase the conservation and efficient use of energy in India. Then you have MTO. Millions of tons of oil equivalent is a unit of energy used to describe the energy content of all fuels. So these are the terminologies that have been used in this chapter. Now chapter 10, which talks about the details of Mandrega scheme. The economic survey says that use of technology in streamlining Mandrega has helped increase its efficiency. Both demand and supply of work under Mandrega has increased. The vulnerable sections of the society, that is women, scheduled castes, and scheduled tribes workforce increased under Mandrega during times of economic stress. Skillful use of technology when connected with or combined with an unwavering commitment of monitoring effectiveness of any government schemes can make a substantial difference on the ground. So over a period, by the use of direct benefit transfer and uh, more and more technology, we have reduced the leakage in the Manrega scheme. So with the use of new technology, direct benefit transfer scheme, leakages have been plucked, women participation, participation by a CST workforce has increased. Now, before DBT, direct benefit transfer, the figure one of this chapter says that there were so many intermediaries between the center, which releases money, and the beneficiary. There were state, district, block level officials, gram panchayats, and then the money was reaching to the beneficiary. After DBT, what is happening? There is no intermediary in between. Center releases money and it directly goes into the account of the intermediary. So by elimination of intermediaries, we have controlled the leakages, misuse, corruption in the system. And if you look at the share of payments done within 15 days under Manrega, in 2014-15, you can see within 15 days, only around 27% payment was being done. Whereas by the use of new technology in 2018-19, 90.4% payment is released under Manrega within 15 days. That means the beneficiary or the people, the workers, they need not wait for more than 15 days in 90.4% cases. Now, what are the benefits of this direct benefit transfer scheme which is being implemented under Manrega? Providing timely release of payments, ensuring correct funds are transferred to correct beneficiaries, reducing corruption and leakages in the system, reduction in delays in system for fund transfer, strong focus on security, tracking and monitoring of funds. Then we have reconciliation process during payments between intermediaries, agencies involved in funds transfer and last streamline the payment process and the verification process. But in this Manrega, we are using DBT method, direct benefit transfer method. 
And not only in Manrega, we are expanding the gamut of DBT in other government schemes as well, where we are not giving subsidy in kind, rather we are transferring the benefit directly into the accounts of the beneficiary in cash. So what points that you need to understand is cash versus calorie intake, thin penetration of banking services, law of consumption and debt trap and initiative to streamline Manrega. These points you have to separately prepare. Like if the question is framed as, do you think direct benefit transfer is the panacea? then you have to give a critical evaluation. It is good, but there are certain issues against it. Government must address it. Because if you look at this, an analysis conducted by J. Pal South Asia, instituted by Niti Aayog, it found that cash transfers are not greater superior in terms of leakages compared to other schemes of in-kind transfer such as public distribution system. Universalization is the key to efficient delivery of services against targeting proposed by these cash transfer schemes. Means this point says that the moment you make any scheme for a particular section that is prone to be misused. So universalization is the key. And the last point that you have to highlight and you have to expand on your own is the obsession with cash transfers also comes with an understanding that these will take care of all problems. No. Like if I transferred a cash instead of giving medical health care, instead of giving primary education, the person who is receiving that cash, where will that person go? He will go to the school for the education of his child. He will need health care. But where are the hospitals? Where are the schools? So government simply cannot absolve itself just by providing cash and government should not be concerned with the basic government services that is supposed to be provided by the government. So these areas we need to work on and these are the critical areas that will enrich your understanding of this chapter. Now the last chapter of volume one is talks about minimum wage system in India and inclusive growth. It says that the present minimum wage system in India is complex with 1,945 minimum wages defined for various scheduled jobs categories across various states. 1915 definitions of minimum wages, types of minimum wages. One in every three wage worker in India is not protected by the minimum wage law. Minimum wages should be fixed for four categories only, namely skilled, semi-skilled, unskilled, and highly skilled based on the geographical region and should cover all workers irrespective of any wage ceiling. A simple, coherent, and enforceable minimum wage system should be designed with the aid of technology as minimum wages push wages up and reduce wage inequality without significantly affecting employment. So that means we need to understand the importance of this minimum age policy because it says that a simple, coherent and enforceable minimum wage system should be designed with the aid of technology because minimum wages push wages up and reduce wage inequality without significantly affecting employment. So minimum wage in India is very complex. We have to define it. We have to simplify it. Now the journey of minimum wage system you find in 1969. First National Commission on Labor, which recommended national minimum wage for the first time in our country. Then in 1978, we have Bhutalingam Committee, which argued for the adoption of national floor level minimum wage to ensure a uniform wage for all workers and enhance protection of the most vulnerable workers and eliminate arbitrariness. Then in 1991, we have National Commission on Rural Labor, which recommended for a national floor level minimum wage 
as wide disparities were prevalent in minimum wages across states. And the latest one of 1996 is central government adopted non-statutory national floor level minimum wage that is rupees 35 per day was notified. So here the issue of this chapter is related to its coverage. Second is lack of uniform criteria for fixing minimum wage. And the last is Minimum Wages Act does not cover all wage workers. So this topic along with these issues and also with labor reforms because there cannot be a uniform floor wage across India because some states are advanced, some states are less advanced and some states are even more less advanced. So thereby fixing minimum wage criteria will be disadvantageous for the workers of advanced states and will be disadvantageous for the governments of the less advanced states. That must be taken into account, then only any such policy will be effective. Now we have certain terminologies of this chapter 11 of volume 1. First is lighthouse effect. In this context, it pertains to the minimum wage acting as a benchmark that pulls up wages in the low paid and informal sector by enhancing the bargaining power of vulnerable workers. Second is net state domestic product NSDP. It is defined as a measure in monetary terms of the volume of all goods and services produced within the boundaries of the state during a given period of time after deducting the wear and tear or depreciation accounted without duplication. Then we have national floor level minimum wage. It is the minimum wage below which no state government in India can fix the minimum wage. So this is called national floor level minimum wage. 